It doesn't matter if you have an ICE car or an EV. One common failure mode is the 12 volt lead acid battery going flat. In today's video, I want to share what I know about that subject and how to save yourself a bit of money. I saw a YouTube video from Matt at Go Green Autos this week on how to change the battery on a Hyundai Ioniq. It turns out his has caused him a bit of grief, so he's replaced it and detailed the process he went through to do so. If you don't know of or subscribe to Go Green Autos, then I recommend checking it out. Matt sells EVs, so he's got a lot of experience of the automotive trade and of different EVs. He gives tips and advice on looking after your EV, as well as lots of other content that I find interesting. Visiting lots of new and expanded public charging stations, for example, as soon as they open. So yeah, go and check that out. Go Green Autos. I'll link to the channel from the description. I think you'll enjoy it. Unusually, I felt there was a bit missing from his video on the 12 volt problem he had suffered. And that reminded me that I should really do a video on what I know, as it's surprisingly relevant to EVs. Unfortunately, an EV doesn't give us much forward notice of the 12 volt battery being a problem. An ICE car might turn over more slowly and give us a bit of a hint that maybe the battery is starting to go flat. And in the olden days of tungsten halogen headlights, they would also get a bit dimmer and give us a bit of a clue. But we don't get that with EVs. And so one day you'll come out to your EV and it just won't start. But it's probably just that the 12 volt battery's gone flat and all you need to do is resolve that problem. Designing and developing a brand new car platform is mind-blowingly expensive. The development and validation testing processes are extremely labour intensive and staff costs are one of any company's biggest single expenses. Therefore, lots of money can be saved by using parts that have already been designed and developed and bought from third party suppliers. When the modern EV was born, there was already a whole industry built around the ICE car and lots of parts that could be used to build them. And so most EVs use a 12 volt lead acid accessory battery to power the low voltage systems. We use lead acid batteries in ICE cars because we need very high current for starting an engine. Until relatively recently, lead acid was a lot cheaper than any other type of battery capable of delivering those high cranking amps. We'd got very good at turning them out at low cost. And EV's needs for its low voltage system are actually quite different. We don't need those very high peak currents, but lead acid was readily available and it was easier to go with the flow than develop something new. If we were to start building cars again from scratch with no prior industry to build on, we would probably not use lead acid batteries as we have better options now. And we would also not start with a low voltage system of just 12 volts. Modern cars of all types use a lot of electrical systems and using 12 volts for those systems means a lot of current and lots of current means thick wires are needed, forcing us to put lots of copper in the car to wire everything up. Indeed, Tesla are starting to buck the trend. They now use lithium batteries for their low voltage systems, as they had an embarrassing number of failures of the 12 volt lead acid battery, which it seems might have been because they did not understand how to charge it very well. Not only have they changed chemistries, they have also moved from 12 volts to 48 volts in their latest model, the Cybertruck, which helps reduce the amount of wiring needed in the car, cutting back on the cost of all of the copper. But we are where we are, and most cars, both ICE and EV, have 12 volt lead acid batteries. So we need to understand a bit about the lead acid battery and how to look after it. Like lithium, Lead acid batteries do not like deep discharge cycles, but even more so than lithium batteries. In a lead acid battery, the chemical reaction causes the lead plates of the battery to become coated with lead sulfate as the battery discharges. If we don't discharge them very deeply, then we only get a very thin layer formed and it disperses when you recharge the battery. However, if you discharge the battery too deeply, then a thick layer of crystals can form. 
those crystals will not disperse easily when the battery is recharged. The sulphate buildup on the plates blocks the contact between the lead and the acid, and the acid is diluted anyway because it has less sulphur dissolved within it. And if the sulphate crystals harden, then they are going to be difficult to remove. So what you need to do if you flatten your 12 volt battery is not just recharge it, but actually recondition it, which is the name given to the process of trying to get the crystals to disperse. Not all lead acid battery chargers are the same. The very simplest charge a battery at a constant voltage. The danger of this approach is that the battery may become overcharged, thereby releasing gases, specifically hydrogen and oxygen. Not only is that a highly explosive mix, which is therefore adding some risk to the charging process, but it also reduces the amount of electrolyte remaining in the battery, thereby reducing its ability to function. So instead of using a basic charger, we instead want to use a smart charger. These avoid the risk of overcharging, doing no damage to the batteries. Even then, not all smart chargers offer the same features. The best chargers are reconditioning smart chargers, which offer sophisticated charging systems, but can also offer some level of desulfation. The best way we've found to reverse the formation of large lead sulfate crystals without a physical intervention of some form is to apply a higher voltage to the battery when recharging. However, use of a high charging voltage is a problem because it causes the battery to heat up and off gas, as we've mentioned. So we need a way to avoid the heat generation and the gassing. The way that has been discovered we can do this is to pulse the charging voltage, putting very short pulses of a higher voltage across the battery, whilst at the same time limiting the charging current that can flow during those pulses. The higher voltage helps to remove the crystals from the plates, but the fact that the pulses are short means we do not allow much time for heat to build up, which can reduce the risk of off-gassing the electrolyte. But there is an alternative solution that goes a stage further. By using high frequency pulsing within a particular range of frequencies, you can try to hit the natural resonance of parts of the battery and stand a chance of shaking the crystals loose from the plates. Desulfation isn't guaranteed to work as there is a limited amount to which it can reverse the damage, but it can help to recover a battery that is not too badly sulfated or left too long and get it back to closer to its original capacity. There is one final problem that a really good reconditioning charger might be able to help with, and that's a problem called acid stratification. That's where the electrolyte settles into layers of different dilutions, making some parts of the battery less effective than others. The evidence for whether this can be resolved seems to be weaker, so whether this actually works or not, I'm not sure but it's certainly an interesting idea. I've put some links into the description to more information on these subjects if you're interested. There's a site called Car Battery Geek that offers particularly useful information on lead acid battery health. But is this all theoretical mumbo jumbo? Are people saying things just to sell you a more expensive charger? Well, not in my experience. I took the plunge and bought a conditioning battery charger many years ago, and it has recovered pretty flat batteries surprisingly well. I've been impressed at how consistently the batteries in my cars have recovered after being flattened. The Smart 4.2 seems to suffer from quite bad parasitic drain. I'm not sure if it's to do with the car or the type of battery used, but all of my 4.2s have done it, so I suspect it's probably more the car. There are one or two circuits that are known not to shut off completely in a 4.2, including the interior light. When people replaced the lamp in the interior light switch with an LED as part of customization, the LED would remain lit to some extent, showing that there is still some current flowing. So I have had a number of times when the battery in a smart was too low to turn the engine over, and using the conditioning charger recovered it. That's not to say that the batteries last forever, of course, but I think they certainly last better than they would without the use of the conditioning mode. 
By way of comparison, I flattened the battery in a previous car by using the headlights to light a barn in which I was working, not for all that long. I got a push start from some passers-by to get me going again, and then I used a cheap charger my dad had to fully recharge it. But the battery was never the same after it had been flattened, and it caused me bother after that, so I ended up replacing it. The conditioning charger I have is the Smart Charge 8 by Ring. I decided to buy one that could cope with reasonably large batteries just in case, but in fact I've only ever needed to use it on its 2 amp and 4 amp modes, as the battery in the Smart is pretty small. Sadly, my charger is no longer available, as far as I can see, so if you wanted one, it would be a case of finding something else. Car Battery Geek gives some recommendations, so I would have a look at those. I have heard good things about NOCO chargers. Indeed, I think it was in a video by Matt over on Go Green Autos. However, in that video, which I'll link to from the end screen, he talks about using the Genius One. The write-up of that charger mentions desulfation, but it doesn't have the separate 12 volt repair mode, so I'm not sure if it does full reconditioning. I'd be tempted to look further up the range myself. Car Battery Geek recommend the NOCO Genius 5 and a CTEC charger. However, the CTEC is fully tested by a channel called Magic Smoke, great channel name. He shows the CTEC runs very hot, almost 60 degrees Celsius, which is not right, so I'd avoid that one. A charger that cooks itself like that isn't going to be reliable. Indeed, the reviewer mentions that they have been asked to do numerous repairs on CTECs, so I'm not comfortable that they are a good long-term bet, considering the price. The NOCO also offers lithium charging. I don't know if that mode might be useful. Are lithium 12 volt systems coming, or will we jump straight to higher voltage if we switch to lithium accessory batteries? I'm not sure. I have found a bit of a wild card to throw into the mix. In Matt's video, he shows a Maypole charger the MP7423. That looks quite good, but there's one a bit further up the range called the MP7431. This looks slightly gimmicky in that it has Bluetooth connectivity, which seems a bit unnecessary, but it seems to offer that all important recovery mode, so that's of more interest to me. There is very little information about this charger online, and there are no reviews that I can find. That's why this is a wildcard. I haven't tried it, and I can't therefore recommend it without some reservation. If you want to consider this model yourself, you might need to do so fairly quickly. It appears it might have been discontinued, as it's no longer listed on the manufacturer's own website. But there is a decent amount of stock available online at the time of recording, in May 2024. I like the fact that the Maypole has a display, like my ring, so you're going to get a bit more information from it than you would from the NOCO. Matt seems to have got on well with his Maypole, albeit a different model. It's got that recovery mode that we're after, and it's a lot cheaper than the NOCO. Indeed, it's about half price at the moment, so that's really quite tempting an option, albeit more of a gamble, as I mentioned. A word of warning on chargers, be careful not to chase high currents. I would say that most people don't need a 10 amp charger, so personally I'd go for a 5 amp or less. It looks like a good smart charger of this type can probably charge big batteries no problem. It will be a bit slower to charge those larger batteries with a lower rated charger, but slower charges are generally better for a lead acid battery anyway, so that's actually likely to be better for it. If a charger allows you to manually set the maximum charge current, as my ring does, then going for a charger with a higher current gives you more options. But if you can't set the current manually, it might be a problem to have a high current charger. I don't think you want to be putting more than four or five amps into a small battery, like the ones in motorcycles and small cars. It is worth noting that the cost of these really good chargers is very high, particularly the NOCO charger. Indeed, they are probably as expensive as a replacement battery in many cases, so this is not a short-term money saver. This would be an investment intended to save money in the long run. 
I don't think it's worth everyone spending that much money buying a charger of this type, as hopefully it's not a product you will need to use very often. But if you have a large family or a large group of friends and spread the cost between you, I think you'll find it invaluable. I decided many years ago to invest in a really good battery charger, and I'm very glad that I did. I don't have scientific proof that it has done any better than a cheap charger, but I have certainly had better results recovering flat 12 volt batteries since having it. In summary, lead acid batteries do not like to be deep cycled, even more so than lithium ion batteries. If you flatten your 12 volt battery, it will need more than just a jump start to fix it. It needs a long recharge. And really, it needs reconditioning as well to restore it to some usable health. Act fast, get it on a battery charger as soon as you can, and to give it a decent chance of recovery, use a reconditioning battery charger. Then leave it connected for 24 hours or more. Full recharges of lead acid batteries take a long time, and reconditioning takes a while too, but it's worth it to avoid further problems. Thanks very much for joining me. Your questions and comments on this subject are most welcome. Have you found reconditioning battery chargers work for you? If you've liked the video, then it's a help to me if you click the thumbs up button. And it would also help me achieve my stretch goal for the channel if you would consider subscribing as well. Thanks.